So um, I suppose we should start by just introducing ourselves quickly. Uh, my name's James Mackay and I'm an assistant professor in British and American literatures at European University Cyprus and um, my usual uh, research concentrates on indigenous studies but I became very interested in insta poetry um, because I started teaching it just in a normal introduction to poetry type course. And the reaction of my students to these Instagram poems was uh, quite phenomenal. And really since then, which was about 2015, I've been increasingly interested in these poems, which seem on the surface to uh, to me just not to be very good originally when I started teaching them. That was part of my, my issue with them, um, was I'm teaching students and sort of, you know, this was meant to be an example of bad poetry, but the students really deeply reacted to them. So I felt, OK, I need to investigate this further. And the results of that so far have been an international conference, a collection of essays that's soon to come out with Bloomsbury Academic, and a edited edition of the European Journal of English Studies, um, my co-authors, uh, co-editors of which are with me here today. So if I can hand over first to Anna and then to June Hay for you guys to introduce yourselves. Yeah, thank you, James. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Anna Naher, and I'm a, an associate professor um, at uh, the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland. Um, and my main field of interest is digital culture, uh, which is, you know, quite broad area of study today. So, you know, rec just recently when I introduced myself to someone, um, the person actually asked me, what is it? And then I got perplexed. What do you mean? What is it? <laughs> and then I realized that actually today everything is digital culture, isn't it? Um, but for me, my, my, my primary interest in Instagram was um, um, it, it all started around, I think, 2017 uh, when I attended, uh, attended one of the conferences on electronic literature organized by electronic literature organization and at this conference i've heard uh, a few interesting very interesting papers on insta poetry and um it was followed by um, a lively discussion and actually uh, it turned out that this topic is hotly debated uh, in the field and those conferences gather uh, quite a folk uh, folks i mean quite, quite a crowd uh, and uh, the crowd of people who are primarily interested in electronic literature, a phenomenon that uh, is uh, actually at the crossroads of media arts, uh, avant-garde writing, um, experimental writing, and, and, and such. So the phenomenon, you can imagine, you know, how much of an uproar uh, Insta poetry uh, stirred uh, in in this crowd because very much like like just like you said James um, and the people some of the people actually were pretty I think um, hostile to the whole phenomenon while at the same time um, uh, we, we we can um, uh, not of course we all of us we can notice uh, how much of an emotional engagement it. Um, um, uh, uh, creates in 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 the younger uh, generation. So since then, I I, I was following insta poetry uh, more or less regularly, including also uh, in my in the courses I teach um, uh, at the university. And uh, I think my experience my experience is uh, similar to yours. Uh, plus, I'm also interested in how. Uh, those creative phenomena um, that happen on, on internet platforms, to what extent the creativity can somehow uh, negotiate, uh, you know, um, the, um, um, the digital capitalism and its confines. So that would be my main point of interest, which is, I think, uh, as, uh, we actually, we, we have this conversation shortly after uh, the whole story of Twitter broke, you know how. Uh, so, so that that's I think the context I will be referring today uh, as well. Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, my name is June Hay Knox, and I'm a early career researcher from the University of Glasgow. And I actually started my PhD thesis a ways back when, around when James was also looking at this topic, but. Um, Originally, I was just looking at um, Dylan Thomas's poetry, and then my students kept t going on and on about uh, Instagram and these insta poets. So I kind of went the backwards version and um, was looking at it more critically, like um, 
why are these poets tagging um, classical poets, uh, traditional quote unquote poets um, in their work, even though they have nothing to do with uh, those original poets. And it became really clear to me that there are trends um, or there are ways that Insta poetry is different um, on account of its very digital platform. But then there are also many ways that it links back to past uh, literary trends and authors have always been forced to sell themselves, um, e selling their image, selling their likeness, um, but then trying to figure out how words have been manipulated on a digital culture was really fascinating to me. And that's how I met James um, at uh, a conference um, and just things started to link up. And this is just like an exciting new, if even if there are repeated and recycled ideas uh, going on. Um, and it's just amazing to me though still like even from one of the first conferences that I presented at, very few academics at that time had Instagram and no one had heard of Insta poetry. But even now um, at different conferences I go to, Insta poetry is still very new. And um, even though uh, TikTok has uh, in some ways kind of not replaced Instagram, but is definitely rising up. Um, but still, so many people are quite new to the idea of Insta poetry and excited by it. So there's just so many opportunities for continuing to explore it more um, and how um, it differs um, or perhaps recycles uh, hegemonic trends in race and sexuality. And um, so I'm just continually interested in exploring that. So that sort of lays the ground of who we are and, and some of the different approaches that you can take from traditional literary to digital cultures to hashtag studies and the different ways that we can look at this. But it strikes me that the uh, people who will be listening to this podcast or viewing it uh, won't necessarily have come across the term Insta poetry before. So um, beyond just saying it's poetry on Instagram, I wonder if we can <laughs> offer some basic definitions of what it might be. And I think let's go round the same way and, and start with Anna for this one, if that's okay. Well, it's it's actually difficult difficult to uh, define it, uh, I think, in a more concise way that would be at the same time, um, and that, that at the same time would capture, you know, the whole phenomenon, because basically it is a poetry on Instagram, right? The short snippets of text combined, of course, with visual content. And I think that's, uh, that is something, but of course it, it does not, um, it's not it, it does not um uh, tell the whole story because we of course we have this platformicity so to speak because it is happening it happens on instagram um uh, so there are hashtags which in case of instagram um um uh, actually uh, perform something right hashtags are not just words with you know uh, a symbol uh, hashtags are sort of like i would say a special machinery for drawing interest and for um for um um attention management so to speak on instagram so so i think in a nutshell this is what what really um uh, what, what is really interesting for me the fact that insta poetry is of course um you, you know um this i would describe it in in a more academic way as um uh, multi-modal um, um, literary text, meaning, you know, the liter literary text that actually com is combined with uh, visual content, but also um, um, th the fact that it happens uh, on, on Instagram matters. And the fact that it is, um, that uh, it is also close to oral literature in, in a sense that it, uh, um, uh, entails uh, a significant level of audience engagement in real time. So, so that would be my, I think, a bit clumsy definition. I'm not good at defining things. <laughs> um, uh, it's so difficult because we've already had a challenge even in for decades of centuries of defining what poetry is, let alone what is insta-poetry. 
Um, but, and I'm sure James will have more to say on this, but I think that there appears to be uh, primarily two camps in saying that there's a group of insta poets, um, especially in the beginning, who um, made a lot of money actually um, in book sales, um, but also branding themselves as insta poets. And you have Rupi Carr and uh, Langleaf, who may not identify herself as an insta poet, but others um, um, will tag her at least as an insta poet. Atticus, uh, some others um, who we'll discuss further. But then there's also groups of people who identify themselves as insta poets just because they are on Instagram. And there's also groups of people who don't identify themselves as insta poets, but they are on Instagram and they are using the kind of trends that the other insta poets are using. Um, so that's where the definitions begin to get muddled. Um, but I think it's just also important to keep in mind that this is a, a, an evolving movement or evolving term. And before, especially with hashtags, um, it was very important to, if you wanted to be found on Instagram, you had to use the hashtag InstaPoet, but also other hashtags that were very popular and easy to help you be found because it's just a giant dark hole of content being generated constantly. So you have to use tags to really identify yourself. However, Instagram does seem to be moving away um, from using all those hashtags specifically. So as it does that, people don't necessarily need to use uh, hashtag InstaPoet, use that giant list of tags um, because Instagram itself is constantly changing its algorithm and how you can get more views. So I think it's just important to remember that even the kind of basic definitions that we make may be changing even as we speak. And it won't surprise either of you to know that I, I have a slightly different definition uh, on it because I do come in from more traditional literary studies. So for me, I always uh, tend to default back to questions of genre. And so for me, Insta poetry is accounted for by grammar and so forth. But we have um, roughly, I, I was just taking a look as, as you were talking, and we have 18,121,437 posts archived under the hashtag poets of Instagram as of this morning, and about the same hashtag as poet or poetry. So we have this huge corpus, but we also have things that are not on Instagram that still get defined as Insta poetry. So um, the, the writer that everybody thinks of when you say Instagram, uh, sorry, Insta poetry is uh, Rupi Kaur because she was the first to be really widely labeled with that. Uh, she has um, achieved her fame originally on Instagram, originally with uh, visual posts, because she was uh, trained as a photographer, among other things. Um, uh, controversially, she showed pictures of herself uh, menstruating on uh, Instagram um, as a way of drawing attention to the female body. Um, and then she started to work on uh, in poetry and producing these very short texts. So for a lot of people, Insta poetry is what Rupi Kaur did, which is to say that it's a short poem, maybe six lines at most, I would say, was the usual, um, uh, often all in lowercase, usually without a direct form, so you don't have rhyme generally on inst poems that are called Insta poetry. And I want to make that distinction because there are lots of poems on Instagram, and June Hay has done a lot of work on, on the way that poems percolate through Instagram, but you wouldn't necessarily call a re- posted William Wordsworth poem on Instagram, an Insta poem. So for me, there's a, a genre that a, a particular expectations that come with that. More than that, since Rupi Kaur hit the New York Times bestseller list on which she remained, I think, for three years with her debut collection, um, uh, there have been other poets who've risen to fame. And one of the things that I, I, I found interesting in something that Jin Hay said was um, when she when she pointed out that that Lang Leaf um, and others wouldn't necessarily identify themselves as Insta poets. When we were putting the collection together, we contacted 
um, I would say, 10 of the best known names in Insta poetry um, to come and be our plenary speaker um, at, at the University of Glasgow. And we got no responses, which is unusual when you're offering poets money. Generally, they, they, they at least respond to you. Um, but we got nothing back. And then we got a, I got a response back from Lang Leave, who said it's insulting and wrong to call me an Insta poet. Um, and that what I do is working class poetry, female poetry. I am an immigrant writer um, and people find it easy to categorise what I do as Insta poetry, which, as you can imagine, gave me a lot of pause. I'm a, mm -hmm. a privileged white male scholar who is coming along and I'm being told very directly that what I'm doing is classist, racist, sexist and so forth. And we can probably get into we will probably get into more of those mm -hmm. questions as we go along. But, but I do think that there are things that, that characterise Insta poetry. The shortness of the poems, the fact that they usually lack specific um, metaphors, um, that they lack imagery, that they tend to be very direct statements of an emotion or a feeling. The fact that they have a relatively small range of emotions and feelings that they concentrate on, all of this makes it into a genre. The other thing that I wanted to um, bring up at, at this point, just because um, my write, writing partner, who is also my wife, uh, and I have uh, an article uh, coming up in the European Journal of American Studies, and we looked at this question of genre, and we wanted, to, we decided that you can distinguish between Insta poetry lowercase, that's everything that appears on Instagram, that's hashtag Insta poetry, and anything that's been called an Insta poem is that, and capital letter I Insta poetry, and for us, us, what we found was, if you look at that, that is the question of a particular publisher, and that's the um, publisher uh, Andrews McNeil in uh, Kansas in the US, who published Rupi Kaur, who published Lang Leave, who published R.H. Sin, who published tens of others of the Insta poets, and they are a greetings card and gift uh, book uh, company that decided to make the shift into what could roughly be called inspirational poetry. And they went to Instagram and they trawled Instagram. And I think it's important because a lot of what we do on hashtags is we think about what's popular and what spreads and what the networks are. But Andrews McMeal, when uh, June Hay and I interviewed the um, publishing director of this line there, um, what they said was actually, yes, we started off doing that. But now we find poets who other people suggest to us. We don't necessarily go for the most popular people. So we're not just take, we're not just creaming off the profits from Instagram or the attention from Instagram. We're actually looking uh, out, you know, actively for young ethnic minority, often female, sometimes LGBTQ, but also sometimes uh, Christian or uh, Muslim voices that haven't been previously represented. And we are looking for them to represent in this genre. So I have this sort of contrast for me, and this is the thing that I find really interesting in Insta poetry, between the banality of the sentiment. And, and to, to illustrate that, I've got a couple of Insta poems here, which I, I'm just going to read uh, one of here. So this is a poem from R.H. Sin. It's very short. Bridges will be burned, but stronger ones will be built upon their ashes. End of poem. Now, that is a metaphor, but it's a very banal, very obvious, very straightforward one. And I'm reading that off someone's arm where they've tattooed it permanently because it means so much to them. Um, so we have this, this sort of banality, but then we have the fact of representation. And that, um, you know, the fact that Rupi Kaur is the most successful poet by far of the 21st and quite possibly the 20th century as well. She may be the most successful poet of all time. And she is a second generation Sikh American writer. And so I'd like to sort of pass this 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 question on to mm -hmm. both of you about how do and do we see this as a feminist poetry? Do we see this as a poetry that allows for representation? Mm -hmm. Or is there something in that banality that makes it a problem? Um, should we yeah. keep going around in a circle? I think that works. 
Yeah, but uh, before that, I would like to add uh, something because, um, of course, there is, uh, I think, the whole movement and uh, around this interest in Insta poetry. And for example, in electronic literature um, uh, organization, um, we, we've had quite a few initiatives around that. And there is uh, another venue that sort of, you know, was born out of in interest, uh, which is Filter Insta Zine. That you know sort of publishing venue you know slash archive um that happens mostly on twitter and of course instagram you know what else so that would be you know uh, one of my remarks that actually uh, i think there are uh, as, as a genre that is sort of that has been emerging and is still evolving um uh, i i think it creates the situation where we have um, you know equally fluid um um uh, circle around it or, or scene that accompanies it and another remark would be uh, i think pretty obvious of course this is not the only time that we encounter this kind of genre of course uh there are some other uh similar forms like for example haiku uh you know class classical japanese uh form um and in all polish uh, literature we we've had something similar that was called emblem which is um, a short poem accompanied with the visual content. So, so I guess there are some literary traditions to, you know, uh, somehow to, to bring in in this context, and that would be also interesting, you know, from from this um, um, uh, genre uh, perspective in a way. Of course, uh, I think I've even seen uh, a few of uh, in Instagram profiles um, sort of reframing haikus for the Instagram environment, but that's you know the whole different story. So I just wanted to remark on that that there is much more in this discussion that we can fill in, you know, within the frames of this podcast. Could can I ask you actually to to explain the Polish form a little more because my Polish poetry knowledge is non-existent. So um, well, it is. Uh, I think I don't think it is widely known, even to the scholars in the uh, literature. Um, uh, actually, this is the, the old Polish uh, literature, uh, which, which rarely makes it uh, to. Uh, I, I'm just looking for uh, some of the examples that I could present. Um, uh, uh, that's actually um, a form that was typical, I think, as far as I remember, for uh, 16th, 17th century poetry in Poland, and and that that was uh, uh, literally what I said. Um, um, it, it was a short poem uh, accompanied with uh, the image that was somehow um, extending it, its senses. I'm just looking for 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 the example, but I don't see. I, well, I, I well, can't see an, any uh, handy right now. So well, well, while you're yeah. looking very very briefly. Um, wouldn't you say that there, and, and Junhei, maybe you'd want to take this as well, wouldn't you say there's a difference between the haiku as it was traditionally practiced in Japan, which involves, um, now if my Japanese is not good, but um, involves the, the need for a kanji, um, so you have yes. to have a season word, mm -hmm. you have to have a, a mm -hmm. cut or a slash within the poem with a sudden change of, of direction. You need to have a certain number of on, which, as I understand it, are not exactly what we would say syllables in English, but uh, you have to have a specific number of phonemes within the, the poem. Yes. Um, whereas as it's been practiced in the West, the haiku has, I don't want to say degraded, but it, certainly in English, uh, it has lost a lot of that specificity. So in American uh, poetry, you have this sort of evolution of there must be five, seven, five syllables, which is not quite the same as what happens in the Japanese. You do have a move away from the, the, the season word idea. And eventually it sort of becomes just a form of three, five, three, and sometimes not even that. Sometimes you have two line high mm -hmm. and so forth. So we are not necessarily comparing quite the same things. You have a lot of high no. in Insta poetry. You definitely do. But they're of the American variety, and they do still have that bagginess of form. If you can call a three line poem baggy, um, <laughs> that, that comes with the American style. Yeah. yeah, but of course, you know, haiku, exactly, I mean, what, what you're saying is kind of like argument in case, 
um, you know, in terms of haiku becoming global, right? And uh, uh, of course, getting transformed in that. So, so I think uh, it it also somehow supports my my argument that we may uh, want we we w would like uh, possibly to look into those uh, parallels and um, inspirations. Of course, haiku is um, Japanese haiku is. Um, um, also, the history of the, this genre is uh, quite fascinating because it's, you know, kind of uh, its history, how it emerged in, in Japanese literature is tied in with performative forms when people were gathering uh, in circles and sort of, you know, uh, performing uh, the, 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 the poems. And that was the longer form. Um, uh, and, and in the end, it got transformed into what we know as classical Japanese haiku. So there is a lot of fascinating story behind that. Also, you know, um, considering this oral quality of insta poetry, but I, I wouldn't like to go there. But I, I'm just, you know, what I wanted to say, I guess, is that um, along with this new phenomena that insta poetry is, um, I think both literary critics and literary um, studies scholars and digital culture scholars just get a new fascinating area of study, so to speak. Mm. Yeah. Jin Hay, do you want to come in on this question of form and style? Yes, I was going to say also, I mean, um, not even going as far back as uh, literary traditions, um, centuries past, but even just the fact that uh, Instagram did have a lot of background in Tumblr um, and maybe a future in TikTok. So there's a lot of digital um, work going on in, in the sense that it was already forming there. But that being said, on Instagram, I think what set it apart was, at least for a while, there were a lot of trends in the visual form that was coming out. And you were starting to see, at least for a time, a lot of black uh, on white, even visually looking like a page. Um, and the, the words being centered in a certain way. Um, one fascinating example uh, that I had, um, because many Insta poets, it, it's very difficult to track them and their work on Instagram because you can delete at any point in time, and many do, uh, to just make sure that their very neat gallery style is consistent. Um, but there was one poet um, named Itzkaris who I was able to track him back as pretty much when Instagram started in 2011 and just watch how he really changed in his writing style. In the beginning, there was lots of metaphors, um, not tons of rhyme, but a lot of alliteration, imagery, um, what we would tend to find in quote unquote traditional poetry. Um, and it just began to change throughout the years. You could see that he was starting to pick up on who the capital insta poets capitalized insta poets would be as james mentioned and trying to imitate that style and in doing so his pop uh, his popularity just definitely flourished and increased even as he minimized his words um centered his spacing um made his um even just visual content more um muted in a sense, um, but just consistent. Um, and it's not always like that. Um, some Insta poets would choose maybe a, a flower theme or always consistently having like a dried flower or um, maybe a typewriter prongs or something. But once you chose your style, that was it, unless you wanted to delete your content and choose a different style. Uh, so for a while, I think that the visual content had a lot to do with it. And it, it does bring in mind, like, what happens when you take an Insta poem off the platform and you turn it into a printed version? Like, is it still an Insta poem? And um, many Insta poets, famous ones, are doing that because they no longer have to rely on the platform anymore to get their work out. They've already made a name for themselves. So why give it on a free website when you can just turn it into a book. Um, so if you've already made a name for yourself, then there is that option. But I do think, um, at least for a while, the visual content and how you represented yourself as a gallery um, was very critical. Now, though, there's also, um, Anna mentioned um, the oral quality 
Um, and there, with TikTok and the fact of reels and stories uh, just changing and becoming so iconic, many Insta poets are also moving to making um, Insta poetry as videos, which mm -hmm. often lengthens them because you can't like if you have a two line poem, it's not going to make a very long reel or story and you want to keep your audience engaged longer with that. So you are um, what I'm currently looking at is um, Insta poetry um, as done by mothers and this motherhood movement, um, which actually is an odd return to a lot of, in, in many cases, uh, rhyme and meter. That sounds kind of like a nursery rhyme and yet is still somehow an Insta poem. So the form potentially may be changing, but at least for a time and what I still think is viewed as the capital um, capitalized in poetry is this a uh, visual um, form as well as a kind of pro or prosaic um, it, it does sound like a hallmark card in terms of language um, so that was a starting off point and potentially it may be evolving um, but it is th there there was an established visual I would say form for that yeah, let's think a little bit more about that that live and um, that live quality that that Anna brought up. Because when Junhei and I interviewed Kirsty Melville at um, Andrews McNeil, one of the things that she pointed out was that they go with many of their poets. They go on tour and they go around and they read their poems. And and a question that I had sort of automatically was, well, you've got a poem that consists of maybe twelve words. How do you make a reading out of that? Um, and she said, absolutely right me, she slapped, slapped me down and said, you know, first of all, don't think that these poets don't have other pieces. This is just what they produce for the specific platform um, and for the form, which is true. Um, but the second thing she said is that they also introduce the poem. They talk about what they were feeling at the time. They talk about their lives at the time. And I think that that brings us to a, a, a different point, which will probably help us to circle back round to um, uh, some of the questions that were raised and dropped a little bit earlier, which is the question of authenticity. Because um, I, and again, I'll, I'll bring personal experience into this. I, I run a, or help to run a uh, poetry night, an open mic night here in Cyprus, where we have Greek and English and Russian and Armenian and all sorts of other languages, people coming along and, and, and producing their poems. And one of the things that I've noticed from that is that my, my collaborator who emcees it, Agiris Loizu, who's the Cyprus National Slam Poetry Champion um, of, of last year, he um, tends to say, well, you need to come along and speak your truth. And this is something that people find very inspiring. Um, and I think that, that that ties in, in a way, to some of the visual grammar of Insta poetry as it appears on the Instagram platform. You have these little beautiful line drawings that Rupi Kaur um, uses, and she's a, she's a very skilled artist, and, and they work well. But you also have typewriter fonts. You also have someone like Tyler Knott Gregson, mm -hmm. who's typing on antique-looking paper. It's authentically crushed. It's it's fraying at the edges. And he uses this 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 Remington typewriter that he bought in a shop, that, that, you know, a second-hand shop that he found 10 years ago, and um, bashes, bashes out a poem on that. And then he does other poems in this beautiful calligraphy. And um, it seems to me that there's a connection somewhere between um, that kind of um, visual grammar, which emphasizes the I wrote this, I drew this, I produced this, this has been physically hammered out somewhere, not just on a digital keyboard. And the rise that we've seen since the 1990s of slam poetry, of poetry nights, of performance poetry, which um, uh, it kind of speaks to a longing for the authentic expressed through the digital, if I can put it in a slightly pretentious way. Um, and I, I, I feel that the, the, the part of what Insta Poetry is, is a feeling of getting an untrammeled access to the poet's thought and to the poet's feeling. And there's an idea of the poet as someone who feels more deeply than anyone else. Um, and that they're expressing things that, that we need. But at the same time, it's a very manufactured project um, product. So I, I, that's sort of my thoughts, and I want to pass that back to you and see what you, you guys think. 
Mm. And speaking of being told off, I've been told off for using the phrase you guys when I'm talking to women, and I apologise. I'm trying to (laughs) slap myself down for this habit. What you two think? (laughs) Junhae, go go ahead first. The equivalent would be girls, I think. That's what what brought to my attention. (laughs) I, I do the same thing as well, so still breaking that. This patriarchal habit um but what i was going to say i think it it really just depends it, it's funny that you brought up tyler not gregson because i was literally going to mention him um in the fact that for, for a while do, do you just quickly introduce him as a, as a writer oh because yes. again he's not necessarily known to everybody um, so he is an insta poet and who has just I think one of his big trends was saying, for example, that he wrote a love poem for his wife every single day for ye- for years is what he's claimed. And you just begin to wonder, like, how can you be authentic in writing things that sound really similar every single day for years? But the other thing is when you go to his page, um, it's very, very neat and very organized. There's um, there'll be uh maybe what we call the traditional insta poem on one column and then there's another column of like a a live recording on another column and then there will be another um um column essentially just featuring oh here's my book deals here's when i'm going to be next reading out loud kind of promotional content so um for a while there are those three columns and every three days he would alternate just to make sure that you could always see those um, nice tidy columns so there is definitely manufacturing going on with that no matter how authentic um, his feelings are towards his wife I'm not not saying that his his emotions are not authentic but um, categorizing and curating I mean everyone always curates their poems in in some form. Um, but you have to pay more attention to that when it's on this digital platform, uh, which is where you are immediately exposed to millions and millions of users uh, in a way that they will never get to see you live necessarily, but they can see you on this gallery. Um, but I was even just pulling up a couple of poems that I had, um, or poet, insta poets, who specifically made their they were very blatant and open that they are manufacturing poems and they were completely okay with that. And where I first found this was um, I was in Leeds for a conference and I happened to just visit, there was a, like a, a book fair going on. And at one of the stalls, a woman and her daughter 11 12 year old were selling poems so you would go up to them and you could just give them a topic um or a person maybe a couple words and they would make you an insta poem right there um (laughs) it was very funny because i was talking to the mother about what she thought was authentic and then she was saying how like it's your true original feeling etc and then she turned to her daughter is like go a little faster we have like uh four or five more people in line and and then even as we're going on she was saying well eventually i hope to do real poetry but for now this is what i'm going to do so it's like okay that's interesting if there are people out here doing it surely there's also more online and i found them a couple of them um supergirl reject for example pick a subject and a price get a poem um kathy thorne um hers was really interesting because um particularly during covid times uh it seems that she was making or at least setting very high prices for a live poetry time where you can book her for a half an hour or an hour um, for anywhere ranging between 45 to 96 dollars at the time and she would make a personalized insta poem for you for your subject for your price and you could make poetry parties if you want to have to have two people four people uh, the price would go up Um, so you have insta poets very blatantly giving custom 
customized, personalized poems, um, and particularly in a time period where people were feeling isolated, alone, you couldn't go to these poetry readings, you could go online and find um, some form of connection. You had to pay, um, but it was available. And yet these poets were still saying that their instant poetry was authentic and real and based on you, whether or not, even, even if you just gave them a few words, um, it was, I guess, the authentic feeling behind it. Um, so um, you have on the, the one hand, people who are saying, this is truly my life, um, put into words every, uh, and, and even if you read in the captions, which I think is something you don't get with Insta poems. I mean, it is something you don't get with the oral readings or the published books is an Insta poem has all those giant captions in the margins where um, if they want to, Insta poets can explain their feelings behind it. They can make themselves real to the audience. This was inspired my, by my crush when I was 14 and et cetera, et cetera. So you can be um, quote unquote as authentic as you want um, in that regard with the margins. Um, but it's just, kind of questioning again the idea of like what is authentic what is true when you can um, base it all around the money and um, the way that you're getting exposure um, so that's just a little thought I had on that um it, yeah my, my take on authenticity is slightly different you know because um of course, you know, there is a recurring line in all those discussions uh, concerning Insta poetry. And this line goes, um, yes, Insta poetry may not be real poetry, quote unquote, but it is authentic, right? Meaning that it resonates with people's feelings, people's feelings. My take, take on it is, uh, like I said, a bit different because for me, in the age of platforms, uh, in the age of internet platforms uh, seen as um, capitalist um, uh, endeavors, um, I think authenticity is kind of getting transformed into authentication. You know, the process of authentication where you have to authenticate yourself that you're not a robot, you know? You remember those tiny boxes that we, you know, check from time to time where we need to prove that we're not a robot, we're not a bot, so to speak. So, um, uh, so uh, in this, you know, from this perspective, um, I, I would seek for authenticity, not so much in a text itself, so not so much in an Insta poem, as rather in the reactions that it engenders from uh, the audience. Um, and I'm, I'm saying that based on the Polish example, one of the most um, well-known and famous Polish poet, Anna Czarkowska, I mean, Insta poet Anna Czarkowska is quite interesting case um, um, as a uh, case study because uh, not only uh, is she uh, a professional uh, in in terms of you know being actually um, a literary critic and um, uh, um, holding PhD in literary studies. But um, she also was nominated to the main Polish Literary Award. And still, uh, when you look through her Insta, uh, through her poems uh, on Instagram, uh, you quickly notice this special bond with the audience, with people commenting on those poems, right? So to me, uh, actually, uh, this is the, 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 the place where I would look for uh, authenticity. Um, you know, to what kind of relationship is being forged, you know, between poet between um uh between literary um um object as you know poem is and um and the audience right because that's to me insta poetry uh, 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 one of the essential features of insta poetry actually is this um uh, relationship happening between uh, the, um, a poem and its audience without it it's difficult actually uh, to 
um, uh, yeah, actually we could say about Insta poetry, but you agree that, you know, the fact that it is so widely popular uh, becomes its, its, its main feature. So to me, authenticity would be the function of this relationship uh, rather than, you know, uh, the feature of a text itself. And uh, of course there is, you know, like one, very interesting subtopic to what extent COVID-19 you know transformed or, or changed those relationships that I just uh, mentioned so, but that would be I guess for entirely different uh, discussion. It's a fascinating discussion there. I, um, uh, hmm. I've got so many different thoughts after what you just said <laughs> I'm just trying to put them in a line. Um, one, one of the things that, that I saw recently, I was at a, a, a conference on digital media and we had a presentation from the creator of the world's first robot poet, um, which is definitely not the world's first robot poet, but still it's, it's a well publicized um, uh, project, AIDA, um, which is yeah, yes. a, AI, artificial intelligence. Mm. And from what we saw, AIDA hasn't published that much. So I'm still trying to find her poems um, and um, uh, get get a better grasp of it. But from what we saw, her poems are elusive, they're metaphorical, they're highly difficult. Uh, they possibly don't really have a meaning because what they are is they're generated by AI in the style of modernist poetry. And their programmers, of course, select the best ones and select ones to form a particular style, which is where it becomes a question of whether it's really artificial intelligence that's producing the poetry or whether it is the... Um, <laughs> Uh, the programmers and the, and the selectors and the editors, whether it's just another version of William Burroughs's um, cut-up method. But anyway, that aside. So what I found interesting was that this poetry um, from Aida is very abstract and highly difficult. And actually what it turns out is it's very easy to make poetry where you have to struggle to make sense of it and maybe the metaphors don't fully cohere and the, there's a lot of sort of stuff that, that would make a literary critic sort of scratch their chin and think what this is. But it's really difficult to produce an Insta poem. So uh, Junhei and Knox, uh, Junhei and I have uh, our collection coming up and we have um, two contributors um, uh, to, to that collection um, who have been looking at producing uh, using um, a, 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 an algorithm, um, Insta poetry, and that's uh, Ryan Pruitt and Max Accardi. Um, and they, they put together a program which generated Insta poems. But while they definitely succeeded in producing some Insta poems, it's noticeable how many of them are still gibberish. They don't feel like something that, that came out of a, a human being. And I was reminded of another conversation with another artist whose name I've forgotten, who said that AI is within five years of producing modernist poetry, which has turned out to be more than true, um, and, not, and basically producing modernist novels and postmodern novels. But to produce a 19th century realist novel, we're probably 100 <laughs> years off because doing the actual plotting and the replication of emotion and affect, it, that is completely beyond uh, AI. So th th this sort of question of insta of authentication i think that that that's really interesting mm -hmm. um second thing and i've got three separate things so second one of them um is um when you say about it being authentication and about it being deeply authentic i will say this in a way that is non-gendered tyler not gregson and bridget devoe are two example insta poets I will say of them, they are both very easy on the eye. They are very beautiful people. And generally, if you put together a slideshow of Insta poets, it is noticeable how conventionally attractive they are. Does that emphasis on authenticity kind of bring in um, questions that have never been in poetry before? Like, you know, do I want to hear a poem from someone who looks good? Um, that, that becomes... Um, <laughs> deeply troubling for me. And then we go into the third thing, which is to bring it back round to the question of race and gender. And this is something that I remain conflicted on. Um, we have a lot of poets in Insta Poetry who are first or second generation immigrants. Uh, this is in English language poetry. We'll get to global Insta Poetries in, in, in a moment as well, hopefully. Um, we have a lot of people who are of ethnic minorities, who are of gender or um, sexuality minorities, um, and they are expressing themselves in Insta poetry. But the Insta poetry form inevitably means that they're expressing very little about the specificities of their situation. So you have Lang Leave, who is a Cambodian refugee 
um, uh, who um, came to the States and, and sort of came to Australia um, originally. And um, But she doesn't write about that experience in her poetry. Um, you have Rupi Kaur, who some people have made arguments that her poetry is based in Punjabi tradition. I, I, I've looked at those arguments. I'm not sure I'm entirely convinced by them, but, but maybe. Certainly there's not a lot of Sikh um, specificity in that. And I just wonder if there's a flattening that happens with needing to fit into this. And if that's a bad thing, because when I look at um, when I talk to my friends who are, um, for instance, Native American and First Nations mm -hmm. writers and poets, one of their frustrations is always being interpreted as First Nations or you know as an indigenous writer. When a lot of the time what they're doing is craft, what, what a lot of the time they're doing is poetry. And if we get to a truly and I'm going to use a provocative term, post-racial poetry here, for example, is that a good or a bad thing? So I will throw that one back to you. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's a real bomb, James, mm -hmm. you know, considering yep. also the earlier topics. Um, you know, actually, yeah, I, I think I would leave the whole um, uh, question of uh, artificial intelligence-based uh, generative poetry aside, because uh, I would, I think I would slightly disagree here on that. Uh, considering you know the experiments that my colleague uh, do with, for example, GPT three, this new uh, iteration of you know um, uh, artificial uh, intelligence module. You know, also because people confine uh, artificial intelligence with machine learning, which is kind of subtype. So there's a lot of issues in that. But I would like to, you know, to to pump, to, to 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 comment on this. I would like to um, actually um, remark that at some point I performed an experiment with my students. I presented them, with, you know, um, fragments of a classic. Um, you know, modern mo modernist poetry, meaning a difficult one, like uh, uh, the poetry that they would not recognize, um, you know, in Polish. And, and then I uh, confronted them with uh, computer generated poems and they were not able to determine what is what. So, so you know, and that was actually, uh, that was modeled on the famous um, uh, experiments mm -hmm. by Michael A. Knoll, one of the early computer um, graphic artist who um, composed one of his um, artworks uh, based on the ex similar experiment he did with um, uh, the employees of a Bell Labs. That is fascinating, fascinating uh, uh, history in itself. That was performed back in the early um, 50s. So you know, still we get we get confused about those entities. You know, like um, can, I, um, can I just throw in throw in because because I'm a lit scholar, I have to. That yeah. actually we go back to I. A. Richards in 1917. Um, throwing poems at undergraduates and undergraduates not being able to tell anything about mm -hmm. them so yeah. I, I, I sometimes question whether undergraduates can do that but but anyway yeah <laughs> so so yeah that's so. a new story yeah but back, back to your question about you know post-racial poetry I, I think this is a tricky question though frankly speaking and i, I don't feel really comfortable to uh, you know theorize that because you know for the for the sake of where I speak from, you know, my position. I'm, uh, I'm Eastern European. Some would say I prefer to think of myself as Central European. And and you know, frankly speaking, I still think we do need uh, a kind of a post-colonial theory that would uh, account for our experience, like you know, people who are white, but not necessarily you know Western, quote unquote, unquote meaning you know Western meaning because you know very often um, we feel and. I, I'm speaking here for kind of like um, um, a group subject, but that's that's a widely shared sentiment and um, supported by the article that I recently found out, article that was calling exactly for that, a, a kind of theory that would account for our experience of, you know, whites who are also underprivileged in a, you know, bigger context because of, um, of course, you know, all the disparities, uh, economic disparities, social disparities, and the historical um, uh, context, you know, so so I, I don't feel comfortable um, uh, whenever the discussion pops up, frankly speaking. And when it comes to indigenous writers and indigenous writers, of course, there is artists, of course, there is this question to what extent um, uh, naming someone, you know, indigenous writer or indigenous writer, artist is um, also, you know, performing some kind of, you know, I, I would use a really um, strong word. I would, I would 
uh, name it ghettoization, like, you know, compartment, you know, you know what I mean. Uh, and I, I'm using these words with the full, um, being fully aware that it is charged, highly charged. Uh, but, you know, actually, uh, sometimes this, this label may is actually uh, function in, in this way. And uh, especially, I, I think I'm, I'm slightly diverting from, from, from uh, the discussion on Issa Patrick here, but, um, you know, during the recent Arte Biennale in, uh, in Venice, Arte Biennale 2022, um, uh, th there's, a, I mean, a great example is Swedish Pavilion and Sami Art, uh, with Sami artists there. And it is everything but, you know, in terms of the of, of this compartmentalization of or ghettoization, um, uh, meaning that the, the Sami Pavilion is great because um, one of the main artists there, under Sunna, is a contemporary young guy from Yakmok whom I happen to know, and uh, his art is, you know, really, you know, critical, self-reflective, out of. Uh, ironic and when you see people who come there they expect somehow you know the traditional indigenous stuff you know that was my experience so that 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 was my, my point that actually this the whole discussion on i think indigenous uh writers indigenous artists indigenous insta poets is much more i mean much broader than than we can touch on here i i, I suppose and um, jinhe um i would just say that it's troubling to me, um, the idea, but I do agree that it, we're heading towards that, this idea of like a post-racial uh, type of insta poetry. And I mean, Ruby Kara has been um, accused of plagiarizing, for example, Nayara Wahid, because her poetry, um, some of Kara's poems seem to use some, some of the same um, phrases which Wahid was using in a very specific context um, to her her culture and her experience. Um, but some were saying, well, Kara is just plagiarizing off that. Um, no Filter by Soraya Roberts is, a, I think, an interesting article that talks about how um, Kara is painted as someone who is um, an ethnic minority, or a young working class woman, but then in reality, she's whitewashing um, that the experience of so many people by making it so general. Um, and it is, I think, the way that we're going is very problematic. Um, for example, in the States, there's still so many people who want to say, yes, we live in a post-race culture. Um, and that's very problematic to me um, as someone who is um, an Asian um, or a Hapa half and half. Um, but I do think it's also interesting the the problem with compartmentalizing is, for example, one of my uh, favorite poets on Instagram. I don't, again, know if you count him as a and Inspo is Brian Bilston. And I was kind of disappointed when it turned out that he was um, connected to Cambridge University, um, has worked there for a long time. But he, he, when you don't see his image, you think, oh, perhaps this could be a person who um, is of color, is a young, um, who knows what their uh, race, sexuality, et cetera, is. And then it turns out, oh, he has this whole level of prestige behind him. And then then I had to re-examine myself and like, why am I having these um, expectations where I'm typecasting um, every Instapo is going to be like this, you know? Um, so, but I do think it's a, a major problem and it worries me that um, we could be returning to uh, a, a blank page, a blank profile, so to speak, which some poets make money off of that. Atticus, for example, by not showing his face, um, by making this um, always wearing a mask, you know. Um, but then as James, as you mentioned, Tyler, not Gregson, for example, um, there's many, many beautiful photos on there, right? It's a very visual base. So I know we're, we're running a shorter time. There's so much to say on that, but it just worries me. So. Yeah. So unfortunately, we are out of time. And, and I think, as always with the EC podcast, it feels like we're out of time just as we're really getting going. <laughs> There's easily another couple of hours of material to talk about. 
but um, I, I am being told that, 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 that we do need to finish and, and pr provide only an hour of content um, mm -hmm. for, <laughs> for this. So um, just to finish off with what we were saying, um, the uh, special issue that the three of us are working on is a global voices one. And I do think mm -hmm. it's worth stressing as a final point that this is mm -hmm. a truly global poetry movement. I can't really think of an equivalent. I mean, Anna, you've mentioned haiku, and obviously haiku has moved from Japanese to being produced in many languages. But that took centuries, whereas really this yeah. has come along with Instagram. This is a true social media phenomenon of poetry. We found examples in Urdu, in Persian. Um, there are supposedly examples in Chinese. I can't really read to reflect them. And bring it back to Cyprus, where, where my university is, there are many, many Greek um, poets uh, operating uh, on Instagram under uh, hashtags such as Poisi, uh, Poimata, Eleniki Poisi, and so forth. Um, and you can find those if you're, you're interested in those for discussion. Our colleague uh, Danai Salenti is doing a, a excellent work with uh, uh, those particular uh, groups of poets. So um, I think it is an absolutely fascinating topic. Um, I hope that we've introduced people to the basics of it. <laughs> And um, as the host, I'd like to thank Anna and June Hay for their participation in this podcast. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you, James. I need to mention something in the end. You know, we didn't touch on a very, you know, for, uh, like sensitive topic. You know, one day we may wake up and see uh, our Insta poetry enti almost entirely gone. You know, like it is happening with mm -hmm. Twitter now. Uh, and we didn't touch on this issue, but we are all well aware that it all happens within the confines of uh, digital capitalism and, you know, basically corporate, um, capitalist corporate structure of those venues, which is also troubling, another troubling topic to, to think about. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that, this, is, of course, is where the published instant poetry collections will, mm -hmm. in the long term, be the ones that survive. Because yeah. as we're watching with, with Elon Musk's Twitter, these platforms yeah. are incredibly vulnerable to the billionaire mm -hmm. overlords of our entire existence. Yeah. Uh, Junhei, any final thoughts? <laughs> um, no, I was just going to say that um, I think there is still hope, though, at least in the global context, in the fact that now when I type the word insta poet or insta poetry there are so many in different languages or that have been translated and it is no longer b before just a white and black those printed versions now when you go like there are so many different languages on there different images and you have to actually count to find the ones that are written in english um, and i guess in that way that is exciting there is hope but then when you think about, yes, it's being controlled by an algorithm. And right now, Instagram, this is what they want us to see. But who knows what it's going to be in a few months, let alone a year. Yeah. I wonder if, if they move to Mastodon, for example. That would be interesting development. <laughs> oh, God. Always more. Always more. Okay. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Not guys. Thanks very much, both of you. <laughs> Thank, Thank folks. You. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye.